That's Good evening, everybody. Hello, Philip. Sorry, I just saw you coming on now. Hello. And uh, welcome to another week of Parsha Pals. This week, I know I said this last week, I love last week's year personally. This week is probably my favourite idea ever, literally ever. And um, I'd love to know what you think of it. So it really all starts with a story. Firstly, you have to know this. Anyone know what a yekka is? Does anyone know what a yekka is? A yekka is, is the name for a German Jew. Now, Germans, as, as we know, are extremely punctual. They're an extremely punctual bunch. And German Jews are no exception, except they take that sort of Ow. punctuality and they take that you organization on and they so put it, it into their Jewish practice. So, just make sure everyone's muted. Anyway, so um, you, that, you have to know this. So my friend has a father in law law has a in America. One morning two o'clock in the morning the shawl gets a report of a breaking into the shawl so the police bust in and in america you know they're not they're not going in armed with uh, batons and good manners like they are in england so they come in guns drawn and there's like a crazy scene and they're wondering it was an anti-semitic attack whatever it is and at two o'clock in the morning the armed police find a german jew standing on a chair holding a clock so they said to him what on earth are you doing and he said, the clock changes tonight at 1.59. And I had to come into shul and make sure that that clock stayed accurate. He couldn't bear the idea that he would come to shul the next morning, six o'clock in the morning, and there would be a clock that hadn't been adjusted to daylight saving times for four hours, or whatever it was. And he broke into shul to make sure the clock was changed on time. And you know, it's, a, it's a true story. My friend told me the story and um, it's hilarious. But there's something special there. There's something special to this story. And I think when we look at it through the lens of this week's Hedra, there's this magical world that appears. Let me share my screen with you. We're going to start with good old Mark Twain. You have definitely, everyone seen the screen? Everyone seen the screen? You've definitely seen this quote before. You've definitely seen it, but you can't get enough, all right? Let, let's read through it. The statistics are right. The Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous, dim puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought to hardly be heard of, but his contributions to the world list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and abstruse learning are out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all the ages, and he has done it with his hands tied behind him. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed, made a vast noise. They are gone. Other people have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out and they sit in twilight now, or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts and no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind, and all things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? This was Mark Twain. He published this in a journal in the late 1800s. And Mark Twain couldn't get over it. He couldn't figure out what is the secret of Jewish immortality. If you ever needed a controlled experiment for persecution, you know, in terms of consistency, in terms of intensity, there is no better example of a nation that has gone through every type of persecution in the Jewish nation. And they've attacked the culture. They've burnt, you know, look at France on the site of the Louvre, they burnt the Talmud en masse. So they've attacked Jewish literature. The Greeks attacked Jewish culture. You have the hedonists. And then you have just the, the massacre of Jews all the way from this. I mean, the, the Spanish Inquisition wasn't even the first one, but the Spanish Inquisition, you have the pogroms, you have the Holocaust. The Jews were constantly attacked in every single way. It is the perfect controlled experiment for persecution. What is the secret of Jewish immortality? I'm telling you guys, it's this week's Sedra. All right, hold on to your canonicals. It's gonna be a ride, all right? Let's start with a posuk from last week's Sedra. 
we're building the Mishkan, all right? Last week, we were talking about certain things that are built in the Mishkan. We continue on this week talking about other things that are built in the Mishkan. And there is one word that keeps popping up. Very strange. It keeps popping up in the Mishkan. And get this. It's this last word over here. Tomit. Last week said, And on the table you shall set the bread of display to be before me always. So Tomid number one. Tomid number two. This is this week's Sedra. You shall instruct the Jewish people to bring you pure olive oil crushed for lighting. Number two. To light the constant light of the menorah, the middle light of all those branches never went out. That's the Nair Tomid. So Tomid number two. First one is the display bread has to be in front of God always. Then you have the light of the menorah that never goes out. It's number two. We're not done. V'nasa Aaron es shemais b'nei Yisrael b'choyshen ha-mishpat al-libay b'voyel el-kodesh l'zichorai l'fnei Hashem Tomit. Again, Tomit. And Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of decision of his heart when he enters the sanctuary for members for God at all times. That's Tomit number three. And we're not done. The next posuk so that's the second time in two Pesukim, and it's the fourth time we've got the word Tomid. We we're not done. Shemais 2838. They're talking about the tzitz, which is the headband that the high priest wore. Again, Tomit. It keeps going. Let's do another one. And you shall offer upon the altar two yearling lambs each day regularly. Let's do another one. And when he brings the incense offering, it has to be a regular incense offering. I mean, there's another one. You have to have a perpetual fire burning on the altar not to go out. This word Tomid keeps coming up in connection to the, you know, the word Tomid doesn't appear once in the whole of Sefer Beratius. Comes to Sefer Shemais, it's everywhere. There's something about the Mishkan that's Tomid, Tomid, Tomid. It's just the meaning constant, perpetual, always it keeps happening. Now, if you look, it's on every aspect of the Mishkan, meaning you have the Lechem upon it, the display bread. You have it in the menorah. You have it on the Choshen, the breastplate. You have it on the breastplate again. Then you have it on the sits, on the headband. You have it on the sacrifices, the two yearling lambs. You have it with the Ketoras, the incense offering. And you have it on the Mizbeach. Every single element of the Mishkan somehow has this Tomid, Tomid, Tomid thing going. It has to always, always, always. Now, what is going on? Why is there such an emphasis so many times on the word Tomid when it comes to the Mishkan? We're not done there. This idea of consistency isn't just limited to the Mishkan. It's actually all over the place throughout Judaism, all over the place. Let's look at my Maimonides, the laws of Torah study. He says, even though it's a mitzvah to learn both in the day and night, one learns most of his wisdom at night, which is a discussion for another time. And there are those who disagree. But therefore, one who wants to merit to the crown of Torah should be careful that all his nights are used for Torah study. And he should not waste even one of them with sleep, eating, drinking, gossip and other such things. Only the words of Torah wisdom. Let me ask you, Maimonides, give a guy a holiday, relax, every single night. You don't, you can't even miss one. What happens if I miss one? What's going to happen? Every single night, says Maimonides. Why is he being so intense? This is only the beginning. Oh, hang on. Do we have breakout rooms? I don't think so. Okay. Just got a notification from Zoom. Anyway, track date Barachot, 6B. Omar Rovin Barav Adol. This is question number two. 
Omer Rabbi Yitzchak, Kol Harogel Lavo Lebeis Akneses, Veloi Boyem Echod HaKarish Baruch Hu Mashallah. Additionally, Ravin Baravada said, that Rabbi Yitzchak said, one who is accustomed to come to the synagogue and did not come one day, the Holy One, blessed be he, asks about him. And we've all come to that class, you know, and we missed a day and we come back the next day, the teacher says, where were you? But this is God. God, he, and he, he's not saying if anyone misses a day. There's, there's a sort of a specific group of people that God gets upset with if they miss. And if you come every day and then you miss one day, God's like, where are you? And the, the Gemara goes on to talk about it. it. says, if you were missed it for doing a mitzvah, you were doing something good, then Hashem doesn't mind. But if you were just sort of sleeping in or you weren't doing anything of any particular significance and you missed one day, God's upset with you. And question number two is, well, what? Relax, Hashem, give a guy a break. What's this whole thing about consistency? Why is it so important? So question number one, question number one really was Mark Twain. Mark Twain's question, what's the secret of the Jews' immortality? Question number two, was Maimonides. Yeah. Why do I have to learn every single night? Question number three is the Gemara in Brachot. So I came to Shul nine times out of ten. The one time God's going to get annoyed at me. What's going on here? The next question. We're, we're, we're bombing through these questions, guys, but it's everywhere. This, this idea is like all over the place. And it seems to be such a big deal. We have to understand why. Get this one. The next one. Shulchan Aruch, Simon 5491. One is required to fast on the 9th of Av, the 17th of Tammuz, the 3rd of Tishrei, and the 9th of Teves because of the tragic things that happened on them. Okay, and these are fast things that we might be might be uh, familiar with. You know, you have to fast on these days. Okay, now the question is, well, what were the terrible things? What were the terrible things that happened on these days? Now we're going to play a game called Spot the Odd One Out. On the 17th of Tumbles, five tragedies occurred. All right, now I need you to spot the odd one out. All right, what are the five things that happened on the 17th of Tumbles? And we're fasting. We're fasting because of these five tragedies. Number one, the Ten Commandments were smashed. Pretty tragic. Number two, the bringing of the daily sacrifice was stopped in the first temple. Okay. Number three, the walls to Jerusalem were breached, which was the first step in the destruction of the second temple. Pretty tragic. You know, the, the, the massacres that happened in the destruction of the second temple, really, really not for the faint of heart. And the fourth one, Oh, I don't know why I've only put four. Maybe there's only fourth tragedies. I don't know. I've missed that one. Okay, never mind. The fourth one, Apostomus burnt a Torah scroll and erected an idol in the courtyard of the temple, the holy temple. Burning a Torah scroll, idols in the Beit HaMikdash, pretty tragic. Except number two. What is, what is number two? The bringing of the daily sacrifice was stopped in the first temple. Why is that something that till today we fast in commemoration of. It just seems, you know, the smashing of the Ten Commandments, that was, that was a massive deal. The, the destruction of Jerusalem, the burning of the Sefer Torah, these are big deals. But the bringing of the daily sacrifice, I don't know. It's just not sure. The next question. We're doing a lot of questions today. And this this is really off the deep end. There's a Sefer, a book called The Ways of the Righteous, and uh, it's a very, a very rigorous book where it goes through different character traits and different themes in Jewish thought. And he has a chapter on the chapter of regret. Interestingly enough, no one knows who wrote this book. It's called Orchot Tzadikim. No one knows who wrote it, but it's uh, clearly someone very learned who wrote it. Now he says, I'm just going to Despite the fact that it is good that one regrets something that they've done and moves to change bad habits and traits, it is good to regret things and it is good to have a sort of a development of the positive traits. It's good for one to set themselves up in a way that one will not need to switch from custom to custom and trait to trait. And this 
setting yourself up that you don't have to change, is the epitome of good. And one should not switch from custom to custom. And here we go off the deep end, guys. For it is a very disgusting thing, one who changes constantly. And he is a disgust to the world, even if he switches from good trait to good trait. As they say in Hebrew, Habibi, calm down. You know, so, you know, I used to come to the 8.30 minion and now I'm going to the 9.30 minion. And we're going to start yelling at this guy. You are a disgust in the eyes of the world. You're a global disgust. What? what? Why is this such a big deal? Leave the guy alone. He's just, you know, one week he goes here, one week he goes there. He's not doing anything wrong. What's bothering the Orcha Sadiqim so much that he uses such intense language. What's happening here? We're not done. This one, okay, so this ends the section of questions about consistency. You know, let's quickly go through them again. Let's see if we can find them. Again, question number one was Mark Twain. What is the secret of Jewish immortality? Question number one. Question number two was. This Sedra, just tom it like eight, nine times the, the idea of consistency, all associated with the Mishkan. You have the breastplate and you have the incense and you have the, 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 the Mizbeach, the, the altar, and you have the, 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 the headband. Tom it, tom it, tom it, tom it, always, always, always. We get it. Why are you mentioning it at every facet of the Mishkan? Question number three was Maimonides. Give me a night off. So, so I'll miss one night of Torah learning. And What's going to happen? Why do I have to learn every single night? In brachot. I came to shore every day and I missed one day. God's breathing down my neck. Where were you, huh? Oh, come on. I was there nine times out of ten. What's the big deal? And he's only having a go, by the way, at the people that came every day. The guy that never shows up, God's not bothered with him. The guy that has never got out of bed once in six months to come to shore, Hashem leaves him alone. But for me, who's been coming every single day, I missed one. Or I'm, I'm the guy with the issues. After that, we have Shiva Asa Batamas, the 17th of Tamas, where five tragedies occurred. And one of them was the cancelling of a korban. It's like, it doesn't seem to fit the bill with, the, with genocide and the smashing of the, of the Ten Commandments. And then we have the Orchat Sadiq and the Ways of the Righteous going off at people who go to the 8.30 minion and then go to the 9.30 minion. Now we have just a series of other questions. And by the way, every single one of these questions is going to be answered with one topic, one concept, one concept. You get this, every single one of these questions falls into place. It's not like there's six different answers, it's one answer. Ethics of the Fathers 2, 4. Hillel Omer, al tifresh minat sibul. Don't celebrate from the community. And statement number two is the al tamin ba'at smacha and yom Hillel said, do not separate from the community and do not trust yourself until the day of your death. What is the connection between these two? Hillel saying, be a community guy and also don't trust yourself. What's the connection between these two? This next question is hilarious. It's like the worst lawyer ever. You know, I, I like this lawyer story. It's sort of the other way around. There's a mitigation lawyer in uh, the show I grew up in, Edge United. And then for those who aren't familiar with mitigation lawyers, let's say you got caught red handed, you know, you broke into someone's house, you know, and you're, you're standing there holding the TV with a balaclava over your head at four o'clock in the morning. The police bust in and you're standing there holding the TV. What are you going to say in your defense? You know, you're clearly robbing this house. So you get what's called a mitigation lawyer. A mitigation lawyer basically says, no, you don't understand. This guy was a really a good guy and he uh, didn't mean it. And. So I had a, I know someone in my uh, previous community where I grew up who was a mitigation lawyer, and he stood up defending a client who got caught red-handed doing something. And he said, you don't understand this man. He grew up in a horrendous background. He had a broken home. He was abused. And he overcame all of that to become a good husband and a good father. He just fell on hard times, and he needs to put bread on the table. That's why he committed this crime. Your Honor, Please give him a very mild sentence. And he sat down and his client said to the lawyer, that's a very nice story, sir. Who are you talking about? 
And the lawyer's like, I'm talking about you, you, you moron. Anyway, so he's a good lawyer. But Moses turns out that he might just be the worst lawyer of all time. To give you a bit of context, folks, the Jewish people are up the creek with no paddle. You know, it's the golden calf, royally messed up. And God, in, in source 13 here, he said to Moshe, I have seen this people. It is a stiff-necked people. I'm done with these guys. Leave me alone, Moses. My anger is going to blaze forth against them. I may destroy them and make, you, make of you a great nation. Hashem says, I'm done with this people. Forget it. Moses, you're the only good one out there. We're going to start again from you. And these people just forget. And by the way, what's the reason? Remember, the reason why God is saying this is Am they are a very stiff necked people. Now, I think I have just confused. I've just put this source in the wrong place. But source 15 sees Moses coming back to Hashem. And he says, Hashem, this is the big speech, guys. It's the big speech. You know, it's don't ditch the Jewish people. Don't destroy them. They're really good. And this is like the last pitch. Moses defending the Jewish nation, right? What does he come up with? Vayoyme says to Moses, says Moses to Hashem, If I could just find favor in your eyes, Hashem, Adonai. Please, God, stay with the Jewish people. Why? Because they're a stiff-necked people. What are you doing? You said the reason why you should come back to the Jewish people is the very reason you wanted to destroy them in the first place. God said, I'm done with this people. They're stiff necked. I'm finished. I'm wiping them all out. Moses says, come back to the Jewish people because they're stiff necked. It's like, don't mention the war. Yeah, <laughs> the stiff necked angle nearly got us wiped out. All right, Moses, stop mentioning that. Start telling Hashem how amazing we are, not telling them the reason you want to destroy what is going on and i've only got questions tonight people i've only got problems but every single one of these every single one of these is answered by one idea we haven't got there yet but hold on to your canonicals get this i think this is going to be our last question yeah this is going to be our last question all right track date sucker 52a if you had to describe the devil folks you had to describe satan himself what words would you use to describe the devil? Well, Sukkah sees a few suggestions. Darash Rabbi Avira v'itema Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Rabbi Avira, or according to some, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi expanded. There are seven names attributed to the Sotom. Number one, and again, guys, this is a spot the evil, spot the odd one out. Spot the odd one out of these seven names. He is evil. He is uncircumcised, which is a reference to callous it means to not have a sensitivity to other people he is impure he is hated he is a stumbling block and he is a rock and a hidden one meaning that he's very cunning and deceptive now evil fits the bill uncircumcised he's like a callous cruel person yeah he's impure yeah hated one yeah he's a rock yeah hidden one yeah stumbling block he's sort of like gets in the way as you're running to the bus he's the guy that sort of like leaves his stuff on the floor he leaves his lego on the floor and you trip over that's like the best name we've got for satan he's like a mild inconvenience a slight nuisance come on it's got to be more than that so that brings us to the end of an exhaustive list of questions let's go through them all just one more time and then we're going to answer what is like 15 questions with one point. Mark Twain, why do the Jews hang around for so long? What is going on this week, Cedra, when we mention the word Tomid, meaning always, the whole time? Maimonides doesn't give us a night off for learning Torah. Come on, Maimonides. Let's say I want to have one night off. What's the big deal? In Brachot, we have Hashem going mad at the people that misses one day. We have a fast day for generations, for eternity, based partially on one sacrifice being cancelled. Interesting. We have the ways of the righteous going absolutely hopping mad with anyone who changes from good trait to good trait. 
not quite sure why that is. Ethics of the fathers, what's going on? Don't separate from the community and also don't trust yourself until the day of your death. What is the connection between those two? Moses, the worst lawyer of all time, telling God to come back to the Jewish people for the very reason he wanted to destroy us. And finally, stumbling block, the most petrifying name for evil incarnate. There is one idea, there is one idea that answers every single one of these questions. But first we have to ask ourselves, probably one of the most fundamental questions that we have to ask ourselves as a Jew. How can I connect to God? How is it possible? I, I always I had this image in my mind of these two angels talking to each other when God created the man. When God created man, these two angels were probably sitting there having a cup of coffee with her. And one say, you'll never guess what God did. And the other was like, yeah, what did he do? What did he do? He made humans. And the, the other angel will go like, oh yeah, well, what's a human? And the first angel will go, they're very weird creature. They're sort of like, they're made in the image of God, but they have to like lie down and go unconscious every day for about a third of the day. And if they don't do that lying down unconscious thing, they die. And they also have to take bits of like physicality and put it in them and they call it eating. And if they don't do that, then they die. And they also have to get water and they also have, to, and they have to put that in their body. Otherwise they die. And they also have to go to the bathroom. And if they don't, then they die. And guess what? After all that, they die. And I can imagine the second angel sipping his coffee going, that's a weird, that's a weird invention. And the whole world is sort of climaxing, like the apex of creation is this human thing. Uh, yeah. It just sounds weird. And also, by the way, the purpose of this pathetic creature called a human is to connect to God. And I can imagine the angels are sort of shaking their head going, this is a bit weird. And it's a good question. Like, if that theoretical conversation ever happened, like, I would sympathise with the angels. How are we supposed to connect as finite beings? How are we supposed to connect to God? Any more than a sound is supposed to connect to a physical object. There's such incompatible things. A sound is never connect, going to connect to an object, never going to become one. So how as humans can we connect to God? What's the answer? The answer to this question and every other question that we've raised this evening is this posuk in Malachi. Malachi is the last of the prophets. He's the last one. And in the very final few verses of the final writings of the final prophets, there comes this one pasuk. Look at this, guys. Ki ani Hashem loy shonisi, va'atem b'nei Yaakov loy kalisem. This is the answer. For I am the Lord, I have not changed. And you are the children of Jacob, you have not ceased to be. The whole world changes. The earth itself constantly moves not only on one axis but on two seasons the life cycles everything is constantly changing and moving even the most stable of things are rotating on the world on the globe itself and even in themselves atoms we know today constantly vibrate there is nothing in the world that is at zero degrees kelvin meaning everything to the most basic minuscule level atomic level is moving everything is changing we have the law of entropy where things move towards chaos everything in the entire world is constantly moving there is no such thing as the physical constant but there is one constant in the entire physical existence there is one thing that is not moving there is one thing that is not changing and that is god I am the Lord and I do not change. And it makes sense from a theological perspective. God can't change because then he's not infinite and he can't be bound by time. And time is change. You can only measure time through change. Meaning, how do we measure time? It's the clock moving or before that it was the sun moving. And on a macro scale, it's the seasons and the our entire perception of time is based on change. So God can't change. He's not limited to time. 
The one constant in the entire existence is God. Now look at the second part of this passage. That Atem B'nei Yaakov locally sent. And you, the sons of Jacob, the Jewish people, have not ceased to be. And there's a connection. The answer to Mark Twain's question of how were the Jews so eternal is somehow connected. Ki ani Hashem lo shanisi. I am Hashem and I do not change. And the way we connect to God, the way we connect to Hashem, as physical and as temporal as we may be, is loy shanisi. It's to create that sense of constancy, except it's not consistency, it's to be eternal. When we get that spark of eternity imbued into ourselves, into our daily structure, when we can say that I'm going to come to shul every single day, no matter what happens, we connect to God. We align ourselves with the force that never changes because we have something within ourselves that never changes. And this answers every single question. Let's go all the way back to the top. It's not consistent. It's eternal. What is the secret of the Jews' immortality? If I could sit down and have a cup of tea with Mark Twain, I think he's more of a tea guy than coffee. I tell him, the secret of Jewish immortality is Loishanisi. We just don't change. It's that guy at two o'clock in the morning who's going to break into shawl to make sure the clock stays right. We just can't change. We're just so focused. We're so dedicated to what we do that we are above time. We're above change. The Greeks and the Romans and the Persians who held up their torch high and then faded or sit in twilight, they changed. They moved with the sands of time. The seasons carried them along, but the Jews never did that. Why is it that in the Mishkan, it's Tomit, it's always, 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 always. Because what is the Mishkan? Mishkan is heaven expressed in terms of earth. It's a model or it's an interface between us and God. So of course we go bonkers about the word Tomit. Of course we're always saying that things have to be constant in every aspect of the Mishkan's creation and service. Because that's how you connect to God. To connect to the God which is Loshanisi, to connect to the God which doesn't change, we have to adopt that mentality. We have to take that spark of constance, of that eternal, of eternity, rise above time and put it into our service with Hashem. So of course, the daily bread has to be there always. Of course, there has to be a light on the menorah that never goes out. Of course, when Aaron goes and he has the, the breastplate on him, it has to be constantly there. Of course, when we have the tzitz, the headband of the high priest, it has to always be there. Of course, when we have a korban, it has to be every single day. Of course, when we do katores, it has to be constant. And of course, there has to be a fire on the mizbeach that never goes out. Because guess what, folks? The way you connect to a God is to rise above time. It's to rise above change. It's to never stop. I am Hashem and I do not change. And if you connect to that, if you can connect to that constancy, that eternity, you will never be wiped out, says the dying cry of Malachi in the prophets. And of course, the Rambam says, if you want to merit to Torah, the connection to Torah properly, you have to do it every single day. Because guess what, folks? That's how you connect to God. That's how you connect to God, by doing something eternally, not cons constantly, not even consistently, it's eternal. Of course, the Gemara in Barachot says that if someone was coming to shul every single day, they were doing it. They were getting that consistency. They connected to eternity and then they missed a beat. Of course, God says, where were you? You were about to get something so special. You were going to connect to something amazing. But when you missed that beat, you became subject to time. You became subject to change. You became finite. It's just a bit more limited. 
And that's why God says, where were you? HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mashallah. He says, where did that guy go? Because he was close. He was making it to that connection. He was going to rise above time. And then you have the Shulchan Aruch that says that five, the Mishnah Brewer that says that five tragedies occurred. What's the tragedy of missing the daily sacrifice? It's that it was every single day. That's what it was. It happened constantly. And when you stop that chain, when you break that eternal connection, that eternal system, you lose a connection to the eternal. You lose a connection to God because I am Hashem and I do not change. And if something changes, then we became boxed in to time. We become boxed in to change. The physical world grabs us once more. And the, the ways of the righteous goes off the deep end at people that are changing even from good trait to good trait, because it's not about what you're doing. It's how consistently do you do it? So if you're doing one form of good practice and then you switch to another form of good practice, you might be doing good things, but you're lacking that connection. You're lacking that connection to the eternal. You're still somewhat beholden to time and change. And this is magical. Ethics of the Father, Hillel Omer, Al Tifrash Minatzibu, do not separate from the community, but Al Tamin Ba'atzmacha and Yomoscha. What's the connection? So you have to see the Ramchal here, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Ratzato, in his Derech Chaim, when he, his commentary on ethics of the fathers. He asks this very question. He says, What's the connection? What's the connection between the community and don't trust yourself? And he says, For the community who are the collective are steady and have a greater constancy. Therefore, one who separates from the community separates himself from the ultimate constant, for the individual is one who changes. And therefore, the Mishnah says, do not separate yourself from the community, and immediately after says, do not trust yourself until the day you die. Why? Because the individual is fickle and is subject to change, and can change every hour and every second, as he is subject to time, which changes constantly. And if you connect to a community, that's a fantastic way, says Rabbi Moshe Chaim Natsata, it's a fantastic way to ensure that you are connected to something eternal. The Jewish community is something that doesn't change. It's something that gives you an access to God. And that's why Hillel says, do not separate yourself from the community, because if you do, you will not be able to trust yourself until the day of your death, because you might just change every minute or every second. And this brings us to something beautiful. Why is Moshe being the worst lawyer ever? And why is he saying, come back to the Jewish people, God, for they are the Am Arif. They are, I mean, the reason why God wanted to destroy them in the first place is because they were stiff-necked. And Rav Hirsch in, in Psalms, in his commentary on Psalms 103, he says the most beautiful thing. He says the reason why, I'm just going to see if I can quote it for you. The reason why Moses said this is because, let's see if I have the, the quote, I don't have the quote here. He says the reason why is because, get this, Moses says to God, these people are stiff-necked, but it's that very tenacity. It's that very stubbornness that will make them the most loyal servants that you could possibly have. It's true. When they get it wrong, they are unbelievably stubborn. They get it really wrong. And they're a tough bunch to get on the right track. But once they're there, once they've got that locked in focus on you, God, they will never change. They are an eternal, immortal nation that will never, ever budge from the service of you. And that very tenacity that they applied in their service of idols, if you can shift that to you, you will have the most loyal servants in the entire universe. And so Moses is saying it's true. We're a stubborn bunch. But it's that stubbornness that means that we will be God's people forever. And why is Satan called a stumbling block? Because that's all he has to do. If he gets you to trip up once, he can go home a happy man. If he can get you to just be subject to change, if he can just bring you back to the realm of time, if he can just extinguish that eternity that you've imbued in yourself and the service of Hashem, all of a sudden, it can come crashing down a level. And this is, it, it, 
I am not saying, God forbid, that this means that if we mess up and we miss a beat, that everything is worthless. But this is why there's such a focus on consistency, because it's not consistency. It's eternity. It's eternal. It's the beating heart that will never go out, that will never die, that Jewish continuity lives on. This is what Mark Twain was missing, and he didn't get it. It's because we'll break into a shawl at two o'clock in the morning to change a clock. Now, oh, this is the quote. Sorry, it's here. It's here, folks. The, the Hirsch quote. And it, it's just a more docile race of men would have succumbed long ago to the severe trials and temptations to which Israel was subjected among the nations. But the nation as a whole remained as tenacious in its obedience as it had formerly been and in its resistance to his will. We're a stubborn lot, us Jews. We're a stubborn lot. This brings me to my favourite picture of all time. You've all definitely seen this picture, but I think in light of what we're doing now, in the light of the idea that we're, we're, we're speaking about now, it takes on a new significance. I was always intrigued by this picture. Number one is why aren't the candles lit? I don't even know if it's a real picture, but the, the imagery, why aren't the candles lit? I mean, who took the picture? If it was the family that set up the candles, surely it would have been after they lit it. And so if it wasn't them that took it, I don't know if they even got a chance to light it. Who was it that took this picture? Who was it? that was so impressed by this image. And what's so impressive about this image? And to me, this picture means that it doesn't matter what's going on outside that window pane, but my windowsill will always have a menorah, no matter what happens. And there might be Nazi bands parading up and down the street outside, but my home will always be a place of Jewish worship. I'm a stubborn, stiff-necked, shawl-breaking, two o'clock in the morning, clock-changing Jew, and I just can't change. And the reason why is because there's something in me that's eternal. So this was my favourite picture for a very long time. I then saw this picture from 2021, just the summer just gone by. Israel, I'm sure you will know, was subject to a lot of bombing. And I saw on a news website this picture from a house in Sterot. And is this not just exactly what we're talking about? You know, 80 years later, whatever it was, there's a Jewish home that's being bombed by people that just want us wiped off the face of the planet. And that menorah is still sitting on the windowsill. It doesn't matter if it's Nazis. It doesn't matter if it's people trying to wipe us off the place of the earth in 2021. But that menorah is just always going to be there, no matter what's going on outside. We're a stubborn bunch, us Jews. Now, this is another thing you'll have probably seen. Does anyone recognize this? I'll zoom in a little bit. It's the New York Times from January the 1st, 2100. Has anyone seen this before? I don't know if anyone would have seen this before. So... The New York Times, very interestingly, on January the 1st, 2000, they produced three front pages to the New York Times. The one page of the New York Times was that day's news, January 1st, 2000. They did another page of January the 1st, 1900. So they showed everyone what had been the news 100 years before on that day. And then they did a predictive newspaper page for what's the news going to look like a hundred years from now? And it's fascinating. If you, I don't know if you can, if you, if you can read this with me. Um, I'm going to try and navigate the screen a little bit. Um, but they have like um, weather control satellites over here. Uh, they have um, uh, robots demanding equality. You know, um, what else do they have? They have. Um, brew, some sort of Quidditch thing going on over here. Um, if you can look it up, the, the New York Times page from 2100, they've got a Donald Trump the third somewhere kicking. Here, here, here we go. If you follow the curse here, I can't bear losing another link to our general past, said Donald Trump the third, 
an art historian who has led unsuccessful crusades to preserve his great grandfather's towers on Fifth Avenue and along the Hudson River. So, you know, Donald Trump III gets a shout out. And there's something at the bottom of this page from the New York Times 2100, which is magical. Look at this. I don't know if you can see. I'm going to zoom in. Wendy, go on. If you could read this out, what can you see here? Sorry, which bit? Can you see where my cursor is, the mouse? The phone fear. Yeah, yeah, just next to it. The oh, bottom, bottom Jewish, left. Jewish women, girls light Shabbat candles today, 18 minutes before sunset in New York, 4.39 p.m. Elsewhere. You're supposed to say search. A search for local times and for information. What is going on? In the New York Times, predictive front page for 2100, they've got Jewish women's Shabbat candles lighting times. What, I'll see if I, yeah, yeah, this is a clearer excerpt for you. Jewish women and girls like Shabbat candles today, 18 minutes before sunset in New York, 4.39 p.m. And it's Friday, January 1st, 2100. And they asked, they asked the editor of this newspaper, who was an Irish Catholic, what is this? What is going on? And he said, and you, you can search this up, it's, it's documented. He said, we don't know what's going to be happening a hundred years from now. But one thing you can be sure of is that Jewish women will be lighting Shabbat candles. And the whole world knows this. Mark Twain knows this. The New York Times editors know this. They know that the Jewish people are here to stay. They know that it doesn't matter what happens, we're just not going anywhere. And what's our secret? It's Tomit. It's Kiani Hashem Lo Shanisi, Va'atem Bnei Yaakov Lo You are just so stubborn. You are just so beautifully and amazingly dedicated to me that the winds of and sands of time won't budge you. The seasons, the constant shifting of the finite world just won't move you. And that is just the most amazing thing. Of course, it's in the Mishkan. Of course, it's in the very place where we connect to God. Because guys, that's how we do it. That is how we connect to Hashem. And thank you all for joining me. Thank you very much. Thank you. We better be here next week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if anyone misses, yeah. I'm going to say, where were you? <laughs> so uh, keep lighting the Shabbat candles, guys. Keep being part of this amazing Jewish nation that just isn't budging anywhere. You know what? Break into the shul at two o'clock in the morning on daylight savings because it's just the most beautiful thing ever. Does that mean I have to come to shul tomorrow now? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's all, it, you're all in trouble now. You're all in trouble. But again, can I, can I say thank you? This is my first Parsha Pearls and it's been really great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you joined on an intense one. Um, really enjoyed it. Thank you. I must add a caveat here before we end. I must add a caveat. And that's, you can get so consistent and so rigid that it's a problem. Meaning, uh, and I, if, you have, if we have time, I'll just quickly show you that there's the Ruach Chaim, who is a commentary on ethics of the fathers. And he's speaking about how the Jewish people were given the angel, were given the Torah, and not the angels. And he says, however, if it were given to the angels, it would have stayed in its original form forever. For the angels are called standing, what we would call static, as it says in Zechariah, and I will give you passage between the standing ones. So we have to draw a distinction between being eternal and being consistent and then being static and being stagnant. And there's a very fine line you have to draw there. The reason why the angels weren't given the Torah, you think angels are celestial beings. They're entirely made of spirituality. So they are surely the best servants of God. They will be able to connect to God the best. Why didn't God give them the Torah? And the answer is because the angels, as spectacular as they are, ultimately are too rigid. They're too stagnant. They can't adapt. And we see this, it's fascinating. 
there are two times that I'm aware of that angels came down to earth. Number one, famously, is when they visited Abraham, when they came to visit him. And they messed up. They didn't deal well with the physical world. Because get this, right? Use your, your Jewish halachic brain. The angels are eating at Abraham's tent, all right? Now, what does it say? It says that he served them. Wait for it. And he took butter and milk and beef. He gave it in front of them. Can anyone spot a halachic issue with what Abraham's doing? Milk and meat together. It's milk and meat. It's milk and meat. And guess what? The angels ate it. It's a whoa. So a lot of people throw their arms up in the air and say, huh, oh, how can it be? And they, they, I had a very clever answer. The problem is it doesn't work. The answer is, if you look very carefully, it says he took butter and milk and then he took meat. So they say, ah, you only have to wait however long it is after meat. But you see, the order of the verse is he gave them milk which you don't have to wait after. And then he gave them meat. So they didn't do anything wrong. They first had the milk and you don't have to wait after milk. You just have to wash out your mouth. And then they had the meat. The problem is it doesn't work because there's a medrash. There's a medrash in, just, this is, this is very exciting. There's a medrash that says that when Moshe went up to get the Torah from Hashem, the angels wanted the Torah. They said, give it to us. We're much better servants of God than you. And Hashem made Moshe look like Avraham. And Hashem says, to, Hashem says to the angels, look, how dare you not be embarrassed? Because you went to Abraham's tent and you ate milk and meat together. You claim to be better servants of me than the Jewish people. The one time you came down to earth, you broke the Torah law. And the question is like, well, how is that? Why didn't angels keep the law? And I think the answer, according to this, is because they're not very good at the physical world. They can't live in a realm of constant shifting and with their sort of static state adapt to it. They can't really, they can't keep up. It's the angels belong in a very static world and it's very spiritual. But when they come down to earth and they can't mold to the shifting of the physical realm, they can't really plug into it properly and at the first sign of trouble the first temptation or the first curveball that gets thrown away they lose the plot and this this got me very excited i found this explicitly you might have heard of the giants that looked at the jewish spies when they spied out the land of israel so the jews sent spies check out the land of israel's and it says there's b'nai anok the sons of giants and they were very intimidating people. The Jewish spies were very intimidated. And they came back to the Jewish people and said, we checked out the land of Israel, full of very scary people. You better stay out of the land of Israel. Very scary place. Fine. Now, that story is not for now. But who are these giants? Who are these B'nai Anok? Where did these giants come from? And there's another Medrash, the Yalkut Shemayim in Bereshis, that says, I'll tell you who these angels were. These angels had the same problem as the angels we just mentioned. They said to God at the time of the flood, they said, God, you made the world. It's gone completely to pot. You know, the people are sinning right, left and center. Forget it, you know, forget humans, forget existence. It wasn't a good idea. Give the Torah to us. So God says to them in this Medrash, I'll tell you what, guys, you think you're so good? Go down to earth and tell me if you can do a better job serving me in the physical realm. And guess what? The angel said, fine, we'll go down to earth. We can do that. And it says, see if I can find the actual quote. Miyad. Immediately, as soon as they got down to earth, kill Kalu in Banos Ha'ada. They were they 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 made a mistake with the daughters of humankind, Shahayu Yafos. They were very beautiful. They couldn't conquer their desires, meaning that the angels came to earth 
trying to do a better job of serving God than humans. And immediately they messed up and they, they, they started being adulterous with human women and their sons, the, the, the offspring of these angels and these women were these giants that populated the land of Israel until the spies came. And it's just another example. You have the angels eating meat and milk and you have the angels um, um, being adulterous. And the reason why is not because they're flawed. It's that they're not built for this realm. They're too static. They're not malleable. They can't adapt to a situation. They can't deal with things not going to plan. So as soon as they see meat and milk in front of them, they can't cope. As soon as they see someone who's attractive, they can't cope. Humans, we have the ability to not be stagnant and not be static, to be fluid, but in our consistency, but in our eternity. And this, folks, is what makes us so truly amazing. So a little uh, fun fact of why we're better than angels. And uh, that actually does conclude our session this evening. Thank you so much for joining. Thank Thanks you. Very Thank much. you very much, Thank Nicola. You. Thank you. Thank you. Really good. See you next week, guys. <laughs> Thank you. You'll see me next week. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.